I think the thing that I need to do to start is apologize, because I think with a day like this, um, the idea that you're actually going to be trapped inside a confined space listening to people's views about different aspects of the world is probably quite a sacrifice. So uh, being conscious of that in the first instance is probably a good point of departure. As, as, as said, we met on a boat, it was a rather good boat, and we were sailing, and in between talking, which we did an awful lot of, uh, we also had the opportunity of drinking glasses of wine, and we had a rather spectacular seafood um, lunch, all on the boat, and then we went swimming, and we swam into grottos and coves and so on. So I think this combination of the aesthetic and the intellectual is a wonderful way to learn. And I think that the environment that is being assembled in respect of the IAS here, uh, as a consequence of everything that uh, is being done, is going to contribute to the same sort of splendid mixture of aesthetics, pleasure if you will, and the opportunity to learn at the same time. And I'm sure that is the best way of doing it, so my sincere congratulations. What I'm going to try and frame this morning, because you're going to be digging into these questions in much greater depth in due course, but what I'm going to try and frame is the challenge of Europe. And the challenge of Europe, I think one needs to think of as being a particular manifestation of the challenge of complexity. The politicians in general when they are designing great institutions, are focused on the vision, which is usually extremely important, and perhaps no more so than in the case of the vision of Europe. Without Jean Monnet and subsequent Fouchon, Europe would not have come into existence. Without the catastrophe of the Second World War, following so closely on the heels of the First World War, and in the interregnum, the horrific shocks of both fascism and communism stretching across the whole of the Eurasian landscape, Europe would never have come into existence. But that doesn't mean that creating Europe, particularly not Europe on the scale of 28, is without challenges. And those challenges, I do not think, have too much to do with national character. I don't think they've got too much to do with generational change. I think they have an enormous amount to do with the underlying challenge of managing complexity. And you'll see in a few moments what I have in mind in respect of that. Right, we'll now see if I can get this right. The first thing that I think one's going to get one's head around is that we are more connected in today's world than we have ever been at any stage in the past. That illustrates something about airlines, as I'm on four continents most months. I'm very conscious of that particular problem. And you all live preeminently in that space, as the rest of us in this room do as well. The level of connectivity in the world today is perhaps well expressed simply with those two images. We are all individuals, and we are all part of extraordinary collectives assembled in remarkable ways on a continuing basis. The people that one runs into in airports, in airport lounges, the people that one meets on the net, the people that one engages in, in physical terms, in these types of settings and many others, as all of you represent so well today, come from many different locations at the same time. You have a great deal in common, you're all human, you're all of a certain age, you all have a certain communality of background because you are all studying and you're very different. And that challenge, when it's institutionalized in the form of structures, institutions, states, and instrumentalities, has to be thought about. It's not trivial managing that complexity in this level of connectivity. Here's an illustration of what's in planning. That is what Beijing has put in front of Brussels as an indication of what is planned in terms of the new Silk Road, the One, one Belt approach, and the rest of it. It is completely unprecedented in respect of human history, as indeed is the level of connectivity in respect of airlines and the internet that I've shown you a few seconds. So what one's got to get one's head around in the first instance is simply that these changes, as they take place, bring challenges with them. It doesn't mean we should be scared of them. 
It doesn't mean that we should resist them. It does mean that we should understand the implications as we're living through the process. And that is perhaps not as well done as we might like to wish. I'm not going to speak at length about complex systems this morning. It's not the right place or the right time. But very simply, complex systems have particular characteristics which are not commonly understood. And one has to get one's head around those underlying realities. There are extraordinarily large numbers of independent and interdependent variables. They, they interact in a variety of ways which produce non-linearity, non-Gaussian outcomes, multiple metastable states, and high unpredictability in respect of which the system will function at any point in time. The idea that a group of members of the Council of Europe or the Commission can sit down in Brussels on a particular morning, plan something, and then have it work out the way that they intend <laughs> is simply nonsensical. It doesn't mean that that sort of planning, thinking, and executing shouldn't take place. It simply means we shouldn't be surprised when we get outcomes which were not part of the original design. If you take that one step further, then of course you get this interesting phenomenon that one can think of as complex adaptive systems. And the simplest example of that is humanity in the biosphere. The way in which we interact with the environment around us we cause outcomes, we are constrained and enabled by certain phenomena of the ecosystem in which we're embedded. And the interactions between those involve a certain form of co-evolution. It is not that one is acting on the other in some linear way. There is a co-evolutionary development of the whole. And that has enormous implications for an increasing human footprint consuming more, wasting more, emitting more in the context of a planet which before 1928 had never seen 2 billion people on it. In summary terms, we're at 7.4 billion today. We're heading for 9.7 by 2050 and probably 11.1 by 2100 unless it's a catastrophe. Don't take the numbers too seriously. Projections about the future are always wrong. But they give a sense of the challenges that we face in the complex adaptive system of human society and the biosphere in which we're embedded. Now, let's push forward in respect of all of that. How do we make sense of all of this? How do we determine what we should do in conditions of complexity? Whether one is sitting in Brussels, or whether one is sitting in the Security Council in New York, whether one is sitting in the NATO Council in Brussels, whether one is sitting in Beijing or Moscow. <coughs> All of these actors are dealing with this underlying reality of complexity and have to make sense of it in the first instance. And having made sense of it, then seek to implement what they wish to see happen in that overall context. And without making it in any way complicated, we're not terribly well equipped to do that. No one in this room has got a short-term working memory of more than seven plus or minus two random alphanumeric characters. No. Sorry. If you did, you wouldn't be able to cross the road, so you wouldn't have got here. It's only idiot savants who have extraordinary levels of connectivity in the brain, but as a consequence can't process decisions in any meaningful fashion that have the capacity to hold enormous amounts of information in their short-term memory spontaneous. In addition to that, you cannot process relational variables at any level of complexity. The vast majority of people in this room, perhaps everyone, can process three. If you're operating on the level of a chess grandmaster, maybe four. Nobody's ever been tested in managed life. So now you're dealing with very short-term working memory, and you have great difficulties in processing A against B against C against D in terms of the permutations. There are 64, by the way, just so that you understand the nature of the problem. Now, if anyone feels they can rattle off 64 permutations and four variables for me, 
then you're obviously in a class of your own, and you should definitely be teaching in place of me. So, if we recognize that, and we understand the implications of the complex environments that we inhabit on a continuing basis, then we have to say, how on earth do we cope? And we cope because of heuristics. Every one of us has a certain amount of experience. Every one of us has done certain things. Everyone has learned what works in what context. And we do that. That's how we can exist in society. So as a consequence of that, what happens when you're dealing with complex situations is you're looking for the pattern. You're trying to understand what is this. And the moment you think you know what the pattern is, then you sort of know how to deal with it. But the trouble is, your perception of patterns in rapidly changing circumstances, in conditions of increasing complexity, in a world where multiple actors are engaging in the same way that you are on a continuing basis, is never going to be accurate. It'll be a reasonable approximation to reality a lot of the time. And sometimes will be monumental miscalculation and misapprehension. And that's the world we live in. Right? It's a grand challenge. And on days like this, it's a wonderful challenge. But it doesn't change the underlying reality that these are the challenges that we face. <clears throat> so let's try and put some of that into context. If you stand in 2016 and you look out to 2030, and you ask yourself the question of what can I see now that is likely in whatever pattern of interactions, because I can't predict those, to shape the next 15 or 20 years, then I think there are a couple of things that are relatively simple. There's no great magic in this particular list. It's fairly obvious on multiple levels. Certain geoeconomic trends appear to be secular trends. So the center of economic gravity is shifting from the Atlantic to the Pacific, it's relatively far advanced. As a consequence of that, you can take all sorts of data pertaining to this. If you assume China's only going to grow at 6% per annum, and you assume the United States is going to grow at about 3.5% per annum, which is unlikely, then China will have a larger GDP in nominal uh, exchange rate terms by 2028. That trend although there are going to be many bumps in the road, is probably a secular trend. The center of gravity has shifted. That has enormous implications. It has implications for those who are having to adjust to the loss of privacy, and it has implications for those who are moving into positions of greater influence on outcomes. Those who are moving into those positions have not exercised that level of influence in the global economy or the global polity in four or five hundred years. The last time China bestrode the world in some sort of significant fashion was at the end of the Ming Dynasty. The United States had more than 50% of the global GDP at the end of the Second World War. All of these adjustments, <clears throat> on a continuing basis, require extraordinary flexibility, which is unlikely, frankly, on the basis of human experience. The second phenomenon is something that is really only the product of the last 30 years or so. But it is the phenomenon that as a consequence of a much more laissez-faire approach to economics, two things have happened. The first thing that has happened is that capital has attracted higher returns on a continuing basis because of our tax structures and because of the way in which investment is undertaken. Labor has attracted declining returns. That's the origin of the 1%. The second origin of that phenomenon is the fact that there has been a significant disaggregation of the real economy, measured by gross domestic product, reflected in added value in goods and services in the course of any year, and the financial economy, which is essentially the amount of capital in circulation at any point. Time. And you can take all sorts of interesting statistics about this, but over the past decade, the relationship between the real economy and the financial economy has been a multiple of 1 to 11 to 1 to 21, depending on how you measure the financial economy. Now that has enormous implications. 
It has implications for social cohesion. It has implications for the working of the economy. It has implications for the way in which we invest. It has implications for boom and bust cycles. It has an enormous range of implications across the total space. The third element <coughs> in respect of all of this is that that trend is likely to be accelerated over the course of the next 10 to 20 years by the fact that the pipeline of new research and development coming out of infotech, biotech, nanotech, and cognitech is absolutely unprecedented in respect of human history. There is more work taking place at more institutions around the world <clears throat> in each one of those areas today than has ever been present in the past. These are revolutionary in many ways. They are going to fundamentally change the world of work and the world of education. And they will combine in ways that we can't possibly foresee today. It's not what we can plausibly project in the context of infotech that matters. It's not the phenomenon of digitization and the displacement that we're going to see <clears throat> in respect of routine white and blue collar jobs. That's more or less a fact. Get used to it. It's going to be part of your lives. But the real thing that we don't understand is how infotech, biotech, and nanotech are going to combine. We've no idea what is going to come out of that pipeline in that fashion, and we can't know because we don't have the ability to be able to foresee the future or, frankly, to process the complexity. So the level of disruption that is potentially capable of occurring is going to create small numbers of extraordinary winners and large numbers of displaced people. And if you want a parallel to be concerned about, because policy will have to be used to manage this risk, if you want a parallel to be concerned about, think of the impacts of the Industrial Revolution between 1780 up to about 1860. It's not that the world did not grow significantly and appropriately after 1860, despite the preceding disruption. It is that the whole of craft industry was disrupted during that particular period. Social instability characterized the whole of the European space over the 80 years that I'm describing. And it took a long time for equilibrium to be restored and respect the system at large. And that's the sort of disruptive effect that we're going into now. The compression of time as a consequence of the acceleration of change suggests that the period will be rougher for a shorter period. But it would be completely naive to imagine that we're going to somehow sort of sail comfortably through Scylla and Charybdis as we go through this exercise. And then in the middle of all of this, we've got the return of geopolitics. You have a look at the situation between the Mediterranean and Central Asia, particularly down into the Levant in respect of Iraq and Syria today, but stretching up into Afghanistan and the rest of the stars. If you think of the situation in respect of Eurasia, where Mr. Putin, disturbed by Russia's regression in power terms, is determined to restore it, where NATO has no contingency plans of any meaningful significance to be able to deal with that in useful ways. And if you think of the challenges rising in East Asia, <coughs> where China rising and Japan falling, and the challenges in the South China Sea in respect of the Seven Dash Line and various other issues of maritime boundaries, are certain to provide us with lots of excitement in the course of the next 15 to 20 years. Now, if you haven't figured out yet that all of that stuff happening at the same time puts an extraordinary burden on the minds, remember the limitations of those minds that I described earlier, of the chaps who have to make policy, <coughs> whether it be in Brussels or in Washington or in Moscow or in Beijing, then you haven't been listening. So we are going to see continuing stress. And that stress is manifesting in one very interesting way. <clears throat> it's manifesting in di rising distrust with the institutions of representative democracy from the United States right across the whole of Europe. Mr. Trump, what is his name? Berlusconi, isn't he? <laughs> or 
Sylvia Drummond. So yeah. she thought. But the important thing in respect of it is he's just an illustration of a trend. What is happening, and I don't think he's going to become the next president of the United States, but what is happening in the United States is what is happening in Hungary, what is happening in Austria, what is happening in Denmark, what is happening in France, what is happening to a limited scale in Germany, and what is happening with Britain in respect of Brexit and UKIP and everything related to it. It's a phenomenon where people are saying the guys we elected to manage our affairs and provide welfare are not doing it. So as a consequence, there are large levels of dissatisfaction. That obviously makes all of the other problems more complicated. Because now the chaps who have to make the decisions are under threat in respect of day-to-day -day issues of legitimacy in their own societies. And all of this is occurring, everything that I've said, is occurring in the context of the expansion of the human footprint. 7.4 today, billion today, 7.1 billion by 2100, with a fairly sharp curve in between in an environment where we are pushing up against planetary boundaries in areas ranging from fresh water availability, through climate change, through ocean acidification, through the impacts on coastal waters of the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles that we're using in fertilizers in order to produce the food that is required, through the consequences of rapid urbanization, higher consumption, greater waste, and the like, that is the product of our human success. Right? So that's the challenge you've all got. It's not something to get frozen by, it's just the challenge you've inherited. If you were hanging around Europe in 1814, the challenge was to put Europe together again in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. If you were hanging around Versailles in 1919, the challenge was to put the world together, but Europe preeminently, in the aftermath of the First World War. If you were in San Francisco in 45, it was to put the world together after the catastrophes of the Second World War. And by the way, I can go back to the Treaty of Augsburg in 1555 and Westphalia in 1648. This is the nature of life. You're not the first generation to face it. But you've got to understand what it is. We've got to get our heads around. We've got to understand what we're likely to do well and what we're not likely to do terribly well as we face these challenges. So... <clears throat> If you look at those things that I've been talking about, the first thing to understand is they're not a list. They interact with one another. It's a system. I'm not going to do the detail right now. You're more welcome to have the slides if you want to play with them. But one thing that's fairly clear is that some of them are very closely related. So the revival of geopolitics is closely related to migratory flows. Because with the United States and Turkey and Russia contesting opportunities, in the Levant. Obviously, there is going to be significant human displacement as a consequence. The revival of geopolitics is also related to the human footprint in the context of the wider biological systems in which we operate. Because if we start to see migrancy forced by climate change, the geopolitical impacts of that are going to be highly considerable. And you can keep on going more or less ad infinitum in respect to this. The relationships are extremely tight in all cases. If you look at all of that, with whatever degree of foresight we can bring to bear today, the disruptive new cognitive technologies and the stress of humanity in the environment are likely to be the fundamental drivers of change over the next 15 to 20 years. The pivotal factor is going to be how well we manage the poverty. Can we keep conflict at subcritical levels? Can we cooperate in the face of these particular changes? Or are competitive and combative environments likely to exacerbate these? The outcomes, however, on a foreseeable basis are the weakening of representative democracy, <coughs> jobless growth, and migratory flows, increasing returns to capital and falling returns to labor. And curiously, the only thing that doesn't appear to have a profound sustaining impact in the system in the way in which we can diagnose it today is the secular trend of the Atlantic to the Pacific. That doesn't disrupt anything or facilitate anything in any particularly significant way. But that's the challenge of managing the world 
over the next 20 or 30 years. There are lots of different ways in which these can become more complicated. I'm not going to go into them right now. Now, when we look at risks in the system, because risks are in the final analysis simply potential inflection points that can set you off in a different direction in non-linear ways that leave the policy planners and those who are executing policies completely flat foot. The World Economic Forum now for 20 years has had a program called Global Risks, which pulls in now up to about 3,500 specialists in different types of risks around the world to assess what they think is of highest and lesser salience in any particular year. If you go forward to 2012, we started to see a pattern in 2012 which was very interesting. The center of gravity of the entire risk system was starting to become weaknesses in global governments. It was at the heart of all sorts of different clusters of risks viewed in a variety of different ways. If you went forward to 2013, global governance was once again at the center of another configuration of risks as assessed at that point in time. If you went forward to 2014, global governance was once again at the center of this particular challenge. And then, boom, there was an inflection point in 2015. And all of a sudden, in 2015, we suddenly got profound social instability, the failure of national governments, rising interstate conflict, state collapse or crisis, all associated with rising unemployment or underemployment. So the inability to manage the system as a whole had started to provide feedback into circumstances at the national level on an increasing scale. Now, arguably, that trend was actually apparent two or three years earlier. But the important thing about it was the consensus among 3,000-odd specialists <coughs> nationally in respect of risk had gelled, had crystallized by 2015 that this notion of we're not managing the big picture terribly well was now finding fundamental expression in a whole variety of ways at the local level. And that is, in a certain sense, how it is that one should think about the challenge the government's facing. Governments have got new instruments today. Surveillance, audio surveillance, visual surveillance, interrogation of social networks, the use of algorithms to determine likely social pathologies. All of these things are completely standard in the government arsenal under present circumstances. It would be possible, assuming that somebody got a court order to enable it, and I'm not picking on you, I'm just using you as an example, but it would be possible to provide an algorithmically derived psychological profile of you based on your habits in respect of physical movement and social media presence. And that would be available to any intelligence organization in Western Europe today, and certainly to those in the United States. Now the problem about all of that is it's causing two things. Firstly, it causes a remarkable ethical dilemma. How can you really justify that in the context of a social contract between government and citizens? How do you maintain a social contract between government and citizens if a significant amount of the interventions that government is undertaking and the interactions between citizenry and the government is occurring through the intermediation of algorithms and, and big data. And yet that trend is intrinsic in the present circumstance. And we are going to have to redefine the basis of governmental legitimacy in the context of this particular trend going forward. I think it's quite fascinating that people apparently on one level have no care for what they disclose to Google, or to Facebook, or to Twitter, or to Instagram, or to anyone else. Because that's where the data come from. But the moment that the National Security Agency, or GCHQ in the United Kingdom, 
or any other intelligence agency of any government in the world accesses that data, huge numbers of people get upset about it. Right? The fact that the com intermediary companies are selling your data on a continuing basis in order to make money about it, apparently doesn't worry anyone. The moment that governments, in respect of whom we're supposed to have a social contract, want to access that data for purposes of homeland security or combating organized crime, oh, wait a minute, that's an intrusion into my personal space. Now that, that's very interesting. I'm not saying anything profound about it, except that it goes fundamentally to the difficulty of maintaining a social contract under such conditions. So, what have we got in the world today? The first thing that we've got is a highly integrated global economy. Anyone who doesn't understand an integrated financial system, long supply chains, and the degree of international communication that we have technologically today creates a highly integrated global economy isn't dealing with the underlying reality. The problem, however, is that we have a highly fractured global society. The idea that this is a global village, as Tom Friedman famously said at a certain point in time, is nonsensical. In a village, there is a rough equivalence between economy and society. And the role of the polity is simply to square the circle. But we have a highly integrated global economy and highly fractured global society. And the instruments that we have available politically in order to be able to address that are completely inadequate. They're not fit for purpose. That problem you can take one step further. Here are the old institutions. Those old institutions are not adapting appropriately. As a consequence of that, as a result of this geoeconomic shift in the center of gravity, China is creating new institutions which are in a certain degree of tension with the existing institutions. <coughs> and because of certain aspirations in respect to Mr. Putin in Moscow at present, Mr. Putin is playing into that particular level of tension in fairly remarkable ways. Now this, on the global level, is a gigantic challenge. On the European level, it's a highly significant challenge because where does Europe position within these particular parameters. How does it position in the Eurasian space? How does it position in respect to the rise of Asia? How does it position relative to the Atlantic alliances? And that takes us squarely to Europe itself. Now, it's always interesting. We casually talk about Europe as though it was Europe. And almost everyone in this room, I suspect, thinks that they have a European identity on one level and a local identity of some description on another, and hopefully they have lots of other identities as well. But when you have a look at it, have a look at it very quickly just in respect of population, the diversity in respect of numbers and scale, right? 81 million, 66 million, 64 million, 1 million, 7 million, 4 million, 2,562,429,000, and then look at it in terms of size, and then ask yourself simply, how much commonality do you think there is, intrinsically? Not how much aspirational identity there is, but based on interests, how much commonality is there? And the moment that you recognize that, then one begins to understand the challenge of managing this complexity, which is not on the level of 193 member states of the United Nations, it's simply on the level of managing 28 in the European Union, or for that matter, 17 slash 18 in the context of the Eurozone. So if you take that and you go forward, then these tensions, which are expressing themselves in polling data among European publics today come as no surprise. Interestingly, Greece and Hungary are the countries at the top of the pile saying that the government should concentrate on dealing with domestic problems and stop mucking around trying to help other countries deal with their problems. It's a curious phenomenon. Down at the bottom, right, you might think that Greece and Spain would have something in common with one another in respect to that particular expression of value, but that's not what's coming out of the polling data under present circumstances. 
If you look at it in terms of a slightly different question, you get other interesting insights into this. Some nations perceive that their influence is in decline. Greece, Italy, and Spain, no great excitement. Hungary, interestingly, is sitting about the middle. Germany doesn't think its influence is in decline, it's probably right. If you have a look on the other side, uh, you've got something very interesting. Most countries, the citizens of most countries, perceive that there is a large role and an important role for a more active European Union. So people are saying, our circumstance is getting worse. In several cases, our influence has declined. But there appears to be across Europe general appreciation of the importance of the European Union playing a larger role in the Zealand. If you take that on board, then you'll realize some of the tensions lying at the heart of this European experiment. And this is because of what Europe is. <clears throat> Again, you can have the slides, anyone who wants to look at the summary of what Europe is, uh, you can do so afterwards. But broadly speaking, the important thing to understand is that it is 28 member states with more than 508 million people with a nominal GDP that is actually the largest in the world, if you aggregate. So it's a really, really important institutional phenomenon in economic and potentially in political terms. If it can be well managed, if that aspirational role of playing a larger role in global affairs can be realized, then frankly we are a long way past the defensive role in the minds of Monet and Schumann of preventing war arising yet again between France and Germany and destroying the European landscape. There is an enormous potential going forward, but there are huge challenges in terms of being able to realize that. The origins are fairly simple. I'm sure all of you know them. I'm not going to recite them now in any fashion. And there are two areas <coughs> in which the present dilemmas were made live. The first was Maastricht. Maastricht had several different meanings and significance. The first was the transition from the community to the union, deeper integration, and more solid institutional frameworks. And the second was a set of convergence criteria set out in Article 121 of the Community Treaty, which was intended to provide price stability within Europe and allow for effective convergence even as more members came in. And it was an extremely important instrument at the time in which it was adopted. Fascinatingly, when the diversions from the criteria themselves, which went to inflation rates, which went to government deficits, governmental debt, and the exchange rate, all of which were intended simply to allow for effective convergence in an expanded union. But when deficiencies in respect of compliance with those particular requirements emerge. <clears throat> Portugal and Spain were the first, and they were punished by the Commission. France and Germany were next, and they weren't. And Maastricht sort of went out the window until the financial crisis. Right? Now, again, I want to ask you what you think of as a union. Think about how you perceive equity in a family. Think about how people with widely divergent domestic circumstances and possibly at different times significantly divergent interests will treat an institution that doesn't treat all equally. Right. Legitimacy comes under threat under these particular circumstances. And one of the tensions that we have in Europe today, one of the reasons why we are getting some build-up of persons wishing to leave this union is because of that sense that it's not really functioning as a union. It functions in the interests of the most powerful. The next thing that one looks at in the European space is the creation of the Eurozone and the European Central Bank. Now, without getting into the complicated elements of all of this, you can think of two very simple things. 
Governments, when they're trying to produce welfare for citizens, <clears throat> usually rely on two sets of economic instruments. Fiscal instruments, which are all about spending and tax, and the focus there is preeminently on smoothing cycles and enabling employment. And monetary instruments, which are all about the rate of creation of money supply, which is a function of both interest rates and real money in the system, and that is preeminently focused on containing inflation, but, but allowing for growth. If you think about what actually happened from Maastricht onwards, is we constrained the flexibility that individual states had in respect to the fiscal instrument by the Maastricht criteria, except that we didn't apply it quite consistently. And we eliminated the monetary instrument because, in fact, the monetary instrument is executed through the European Central Bank in front of them. So this increases the intrinsic tensions within the system itself. And it makes it more difficult to balance interests between people at different phases in economic cycles, with different levels of competitiveness, with different levels of productivity, because they can't do the things that independent states can do in order to restore competitiveness in respect of these circumstances. They are bound together by the institutions that have been created for this particular purpose. Two things need to be fixed if one is going to, in fact, continue effectively with a single euro and a single central bank. There has to be greater mobility of population, higher degrees of recognition of qualifications, better opportunities for cultural and linguistic integration into different parts of the Union, in order to be able to smooth out cycles at, in different parts of the Union simultaneously. And there has to be some mechanism, which is currently prohibited by the Growth and Stability Pact, there has to be some mechanism for institutionalizing fiscal transfers from areas that are doing extremely well to areas that are doing bad. If the federal government in the United States could not take emergency measures to bolster an economic downturn in, let's say, Mississippi, when other parts of the country were doing extremely well, the United States would be under the same sort of stress that we currently have within the European space. So there are two structural elements around the Growth and Stability Pact, the Maastricht criteria, and the Eurozone, which we have to get our heads around. But in addition to that, there are two areas in which arguably the Union has failed in the last 10 years. The first is as a consequence of the global financial crisis, and particularly from 2010 onwards, when that rolled across Europe in a very dramatic way. What it has done is drawn a line, in a certain sense, between the Mediterranean and the North. As a consequence of that, the sense of unity within the Union has been severely constrained. One of the challenges in this regard was that it was clear that certain countries that had run up very large fiscal deficits and had essentially unsustainable positions would have to apply a certain degree of austerity. Arguably, if they had the ability to receive fiscal transfers from some central point within the European space, they could have adopted counter-cyclical policies and worked their way out of that situation. But that was prohibited. If that couldn't be done, then the only counterweight to that would have been expansionist fiscal policy by those states that were in surplus at that point in time, Germany to the fore. But for a whole variety of historical reasons, which are perfectly understandable, that was unthinkable in the German space at that point in time. So the Union didn't behave as a Union. The Union behaved as an amalgam of different nation-states with differing interests. We have to think about how we can avoid that particular challenge going forward. The second area in which this has occurred 
is, of course, the migrant crisis. Nobody planned to have to deal with the flood of migrants and refugees into the European space in the course of 2015. What we are now trying to do is to play catch up from behind in respect of dealing with that issue. But meanwhile, a group of states further to the east in Europe, closer to the point at which the problem was originated, have come to feel overwhelmed and have come to feel that appropriate burden sharing in the context of a union has not been taking place. So once again, the issue that I think one's got to get one's head around here, this is not to blame anyone, it's irrelevant to blame people in the context of all of this. My argument at the beginning is that policymakers cannot deal with the complexity that they're confronted. But if one wants to design a union, then one has to think about how one can address these types of challenges going forward. How do you deal among 28 different countries with different capabilities, different institutional spreads, different levels of human capital development, different financial reserves? How do you deal with unforeseen challenges in the context of something that you wish to call a union? How do you enable a sense of unity in the face of adversity? How do you institutionalize that without destroying fiscal probity and destroying the basis on which Europe can in fact be competitive going forward? Now, what I want to suggest to you is that one of the things we've probably got to be honest about and this is politically extremely difficult, is that we may have been guilty of hubris over the last 25 years. We may have thought that we were capable of managing more complexity than we have in the institutional capacity for management. That's not to say that if we didn't have an integrated global economy, we'd be better off. It's not to say that if Europe were 15 states and not 28, that we'd be better off. It's not to say any of those things. It's just to say that I don't think we think enough about the limitations to our ability to manage complexity in these circumstances. And if we overreach, the ancient Greeks had a very simple expression in respect of this, nemesis follows hubris. The English put it much more simply, they say pride comes before a fall. But we can't repeat the mistakes. We have to learn out of these particular experiences in important ways. We have to try to determine what problems can be solved at what scale, given the divergence of interests and the variation in values in relation to those particular problems at any point in time. There's no real magic in saying that the more people there are in the room, the greater the divergence of interest between them, and the higher degree to which they individually prioritize different values, the more difficult it will be to reach agreement. It's pretty commonsensical if you put it in simple terms. But that's not how we behave. We still sort of think we're going to solve problems in the security council, or in the executive board of the IMF, or in the council of Europe, or in the European Parliament. We're not doing very well. And one part of the reason, at least, is that the scale of the challenges that we're tackling may exceed our grasp, given the complexity of the interactions, the divergence of interests, and the difficulty of actually determining how to prioritize the values by which we will base our decisions. If you take what we can understand in respect of transnational collective action, if you want to call it global governance at the top, that's great. But if you think about what we can understand, we know that we need an integrated systemic perspective. If we don't think about how the world works in its entirety, we haven't got any basis for proceeding. But the next thing we have to recognize is that national interests and culture matter too. 
if we don't recognize that, if we don't factor that into that systemic integrated perspective, we are going to keep on running into the wall. We need to recognize that the body of norms, you can think of it as international law and customary international law, or community law, or community norms. But that body of existing norms matters. To what extent do the norms already in place square the circle between the need for an integrated systemic perspective and the intrinsic diversity of national interests and cultural values? Because to the extent that they don't, we have to create new norms. We need heuristics to be able to solve most of these problems. We can't start from the beginning every time we run into problems. And then lastly, scale, scale matters. Because you can't solve all of these problems at the level of 193, or if you bring in South Sudan, 194. You can't even solve all of these problems at the level of 28, as we've proved over the last five or six years. So maybe we have to go back in the context of Europe to what was described as variable geometry and varying speed in the 1990s and the aftermath of the DeLorean. Maybe we have to recognize that we need the integrated systemic approach in respect of all of this, but the diversity of interests and cultures and the absence of adequate norms to address all of these challenges simultaneously may mean that variable geometry and variable speed is the way forward in respect of these challenges. Now, there are some very simple things. We know that humans can function on the basis of balancing three things. Essentially, fear, want, and social empathy. When a human is in balance, that's how humans survive effectively. There are all sorts of good neurochemical and biological reasons for that, but I'm not going to go into that right now. We know that although culture, as Clifford Geertz once famously noted, is the mechanism for the social production of meaning, Despite that, there are a great number of values that are held in common by most of humanity. So it is not that the challenge of scale is insurmountable. It's that it must be approached with an appropriate degree of prudence. And we know that balancing personal freedoms, which are essential for innovation, creativity, and progress, with a sense of social obligation, which is necessary for the survival of society, and respect for the ecosystem in which we depend for our survival is the way in which all great civilizations have thrived, and when that balance has been disturbed, it has signaled the beginning of their decline. So those are all fairly simple. If we were to extrapolate that out into a way that we might use to think about these particular challenges today, it might be something like this. We need respect for boundaries. We need to create a certain amount of space that is local, that is regional, that is national, that is cultural. We need to do that in the context of seeking welfare. So rights, improving quality, achieving inclusivity, and enabling advancement is a critical social objective, which is present in the value systems of all societies. And we have to square that with an appropriate degree of engagement, which enables us to respect boundaries but pursue inclusivity. <coughs> if we can square the circle in that way, if we can use that as a normative guide to how we might resolve these types of issues, if we can square the aspirations of Europe with the reality of diversity, and simultaneously create a functioning union that is seen by all to operate in the interests of all, then the original European dream can be taken to a higher level in the years ahead. If we fail to take all of those elements into account simultaneously, we're going to be on the back foot and we're going to be behaving defensively all the way through. I'm going to leave you with one message at the back end. In 1919, William Butler Yeats wrote a fairly remarkable poem 
for the second coming. And I'm just taking the first stanza. He says, turning and turning in the widening garden, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood doomed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drunk. And focus on the last line. The best lack all the conviction, while the worst are full of passion and intensity. And I'm sure most of you recognize that there are very uncomfortable echoes in the present time. And that perception back then led to all of the horrors of the 1930s and the Second World War as a consequence. So solving these challenges is central. Getting our heads around how best to do it is vital. It's not something that uh, you can wait to address <coughs> until you're 50. Thanks very much. Wonderful.